This video is going to show a template system I use in order to start a new design. It's pretty universal and can be used for any gun on the workshop. The techniques that I'll be showing you now will be using two pieces of software, one called 3D Coat and the other called ZBrush. Links to the 3D Coat Steam page and the Pixel Logic homepage are in the description below. There is of course many other pieces of software available that will do a similar thing, but I've only used these two pieces of software. So that's what I'll be using for the demonstration of this video. To be kept up to date with the latest video releases and help support these tutorials, please subscribe by clicking the link on screen and follow Creative Studios on Twitter. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy this new video. So what you can see on screen now is the typical type of template I would use um, when starting a new gun design. This particular template came out of ZBrush, but the 3D coat looks incredibly similar. I'll run you through the process of how to create this for both 3D coat and for ZBrush. While doing so, I'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages between the two programs. So the first one I'm going to run you through is the 3D coat process. So first things first, obviously you need to open 3D coat. Once 3D coat opens, um, you'll be normally faced with this screen, which allows you to choose which type of function within 3D coat you're going to use. There's quite a lot of features in 3D coat, um, but for this particular video, we're going to focus on this one here, which is paint directly over a UV model. You click that. I'll take you to this screen where it allows you to import your object, your mesh. So the best way to do that is to go to the folder icon, then find your OBJs. Now, if you don't have these already, I'll put a link in the description. So for this video, we're going to use the M4A4, if no particular reason, purely because I like the look of this gun. Once you've selected your particular gun type, um, you'll be faced with this screen. Now there's a lot of options here, but really the main ones that you want to focus on is this. You want to keep your UV mapping because that's what the gun uses to apply a texture. Um, you can apply smoothing, but for me it's purely a visual thing, um, so there's no reason to change this. Um, you can change the name of your UV set if you wish, but that's not necessary either. Um, the area that you should mainly worry about is keeping your UVs and the size of your texture. Now, obviously, the size that goes into game can be whatever size you decide to reduce it to. But I find when working, um, it's best to either have a 2048 or a 4096 texture as your base. That allows you to scale it down to a much smaller size for submitting to game, but allows you to keep the resolution nice and crisp while you're working. So for this one, I will choose a 2048. Now you want it to be square, so you make sure both of these are the same. Once you've done that, you click OK. It'll take a minute for the model to load, but once the model is loaded, if you left click on any blank space around your model, it allows you to rotate your model. If you hold the shift key while left clicking in blank space, it snaps to various views. For example, like the side, front, back, um, so the view we're going to work from is the side view. It's important, in fact, it's the most important that you consider what the gun's going to look like from first person view. I mean, that's what most of the players are going to see. But I think when you're trying to do a design which covers the whole weapon, working from a side view is probably the most simple way to start a design. Um, but I would just like to say, I think it's incredibly important to very early on in your design, get the design into game and check it from a first person perspective. Often you can spend a long time working on design from the side, not checking it from the first person, and you might design a really nice looking gun from the side. Once you get into game and look at it from the first person view, it can often be a bit of a letdown. The design can often be too small or too intricate to really be readable from a first person perspective. So although we're gonna be working from the side, I just want to say make sure you check your designs in first person. So now we've got our gun loaded, and uh, we've orientated it to the side view, um, as I said, by using shift and right click. Um, the other thing you can use is the middle mouse button to pan the model around. Um, the first thing you'll notice is in perspective. The reason you can tell is you can see like undersides of objects. The way this is going to work is it's going to project the texture back on top of the 3D model. 
So if you have perspective, some of your lines are going to end up being distorted if you use perspective. So the first thing that I would normally do is turn perspective off. Now in 3D Coat, that is this little button here. So you click that button, and as you can see, that's made it completely flat from um, a side perspective. You're not getting any of the undersides visible now. The next thing I'd do is use the right mouse button to zoom in. Now what I normally do is try and get as large as possible but leaving a decent border around the edges. So something probably similar to this. So I'm using the middle mouse button to pan the object around. I'm not using the right, or the right mouse button at all. What I don't want to do is rotate it off of the side. If you do do that, just hold shift and use the left mouse button to snap it back into place. Once you're reasonably happy with the position that you've chosen for your weapon, the next thing to do is to go down and add a camera shortcut. Now what this does is it stores the camera position based on your view. So if I add a camera shortcut now, by clicking, it says your new camera shortcut inserted. Now what I can do is then move the object off to a different angle to check perspective the first person perspective, you know, if I was wanting to do that, I could do that. Um, and then if I turn perspective back off, and what I need, all I need to do is go switch to previous or next shortcut, seeing as I've only stored one, it literally doesn't matter which one of these two I choose. So I click that and it snaps me back to the side view. Now later on you'll understand why this is important, um, but for now um, all I'll say is make sure you store yourself a camera. So now that I've got my view stored, the next thing that I'll do is go to edit. Now you need to make sure there's a few settings ticked here. The first is project through. Now what that means is when you design in Photoshop the side view, when you come back to 3D Coat, it will project the side view through the object. Now what that will mean is that if you have a line on this side, it will also appear on this side. Now, in the long run, you'll want to uh, edit that so that the both sides are different. But as an initial starting point, it's good to have it textured on both sides. So you definitely want that checked, you want that turned on. The second thing is you'll want to increase the scale. Now, the screen size here is roughly maybe 1600 by um, 900 thereabouts, you know. Um, so in order for it to to be exported at a higher resolution, you need to multiply your viewport size. So what this does is multiply your viewport size by, obviously you can choose not to scale it 150%, 200 or 300%. Now if that was 900, then that would be three times 900 base occlusion. So generally I use about 300 times the size of the screen. Now the reason for that is obviously when you're projecting the texture onto this model and the resolution of the screen is going to be smaller than your texture resolution. So in order to allow for your texture to be fully utilized, what you want to do is make sure that you scale up your uh, side view export. So you need to make sure that's ticked and you need to make sure this is ticked. Once you've done those two things, the button that you need to do is click Edit Projections in External Editor. But before I'll do that, what I'll do is I'll just save this because I've done everything within 3D Coat that I need so I'd recommend at this point, it's a good time to save. So now I've saved that, you can see up here it's saved. Now, I'm happy with my save view, so just to make sure that it's actually correctly in position, so any time before you export, I would highly recommend that you move it slightly and then switch to your previous shortcut. That way you're sure that what you're exporting is what you've got stored. Now you go to Export Projections to External Editor. Now what you'll see here is um, what 3D Coat exports. Now, in 3D Coat, um, I think it's in Preferences, there is a bit here that says External 2D Editor. Now, if you're using a different editor, then you need to set that link up in 3D Coat to, to link the two programs so it knows which program to export to. Obviously, I'm using Photoshop, so I have that set up. Now, when I export it, it exports this to Photoshop for me, which is nice and neat. Now, when you look at the layers that's in Photoshop, what you have is a light map, which is effectively the lighting. So that's obviously it unlit, and that's the light, light, lighting applied. So in Photoshop, that gives you the lighting layer, it gives you a blank layer to work on, and it gives you your base layer, which is whatever color the model is inside 3D Coat currently, which in this case is gray. So now that you get an idea of what layers are 
exported from 3D code. Um, I'll turn them back on. So the first things first is I generally like to give uh, a background layer. So for me, a good starting point for a background, but it does depend on the color of the weapon you're going to make, would be uh, 181818, which is a mid gray. So I apply that to a background layer. Then I've obviously got my base layer, uh, my current working layer, and then the lighting on top. Uh, the next thing I like to do is create a group and just name it and then move all these underneath that group. Now what that allows me to do is obviously toggle the gun on and off but the main reason why I do this is when you draw your design when you draw your design like this um, it, it works fine and everything like that um, but you can see it's it's going out the outlines of the gun. Now that that's fine, but I, I find it very distracting when I'm trying to look at the design of the gun and there's elements and um, overlapping the boundaries. So what you can do is um, if you hold control and then click the little uh, graphic in your layer, what that does is make a selection around the weapon because these are already alpha. And then you select your group, and if you click this button here, it creates a mask. And what the mask does is limit the uh, layers underneath it to only show in the areas that are white in your mask. So what that allows me to do then is obviously paint my design. I'm not going to paint a proper design just now. I'm just going to do something very quick so that I can get on with showing you what I need to show. Um, so say you did something like that, which is like a sun, a sun burst. So you've got your design. The other thing you'll notice is the lighting's really harsh. You know, it's it's gone all red, which doesn't really look like lighting to me. All you need to do to fix the lighting um, is to go to uh, the layer mode, change it from overlay to hard light. Now, as you can see, that that gives you a much more accurate representation of what the gun would be like. Um, it's it's still, from in my opinion, too dark. Um, you've got completely black areas in the gun. So the other thing that I'd normally do is change this to a much lower value. Maybe something like 50 or 40. I mean, it really depends on your personal preference. The The reason for having the lighting is obviously to give you shape. So you can see where the various details are and then try and design you know, around those details. So obviously if I wanted to follow this detail, I could. The, the lighting map does nothing, as in when you go back to 3D coat, this does not affect um, what will be projected onto the model. So you can change this, you can delete this layer if you wish. Obviously I wouldn't recommend that, but you can delete that layer. So once you've set your file up and you're happy with the way that it's all laid out, so you've got your working layer, and obviously if you want to create a different color, say for example I did a red, and let's put it underneath and we color this part and let's say we do this whole middle section in the gun handle obviously it's very rough and um, I would not normally do it this way um, but as, uh, as an example and this explains what I need to show. So um, obviously what you've got now is your orange layer and your red layer. And the cool thing is obviously because they're separate layers you can add a, a color overlay and change this to something that maybe match, works better with the color scheme. Uh, you know, blue and orange is always a very popular color scheme so let's stick with that for now. Once you're happy with your design, all you need to do in order to get this design onto your 3D model is safe. Um, so as you'll notice that when you export it for 3D code, it used a very particular naming convention. It's called layerz.psd. Now this will be sort of saved in a very unusual place on your hard drive. Um, I think you can choose where, you, where it exports to inside 3D code, but I've always just left it as default. But all you need to do is literally save. And don't go to file save as, just, just click save or control S. So once you do that, I click save. So after you've clicked save, um, you should be able to go back to 3D Coat and see the model update with your texture on it.
So let's try that out. So now you can see the model with the texture applied. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is that the colour scheme is different. Now I did this on purpose so that I could show you a problem between Photoshop and 3D Coat. And 3D Coat is great because it keeps the layers that you have in Photoshop. So for example I've got layer 1 which is the yellow, layer 3 which is the red, uh, layer 0 which was the original uh, grey coloured model and um, layer 2 which is the background layer. Um, but as you will see the red layer, uh, in other words layer 1, hasn't brought in the colour from uh, Photoshop. Now the reason why this happens is, sorry layer 3, the reason why this happens is because 3D Coat can't import the effects that you apply in Photoshop. So if you're exporting a layer from Photoshop to 3D Coat, you need to make sure you flatten your layers. So for example, you right click on the layer, go to rasterize layer, and that flattens it. The, next, the other thing I would recommend doing, which I've not done so far, is name your layers. So for me, I normally name it based on the color, so yellow and blue. I usually call this base. The other thing you can do before you export is to delete the background layer if you wish. But to be honest, I usually leave that there and then I can delete it in 3D Coat as opposed to losing the background from the Photoshop file. There's a lot of things which get exported incorrectly between Photoshop and 3D Coat. The other thing is the group. If you go back to 3D Coat, you'll notice there isn't any group. What is done is made the group layer just a random layer within your layers. So after your export, you can pretty much delete those. So in order to update this to match um, 3D Coat, I will save this file again. So save, and I'll go back. Now you'll notice the next problem that's happened. It imports a duplicate of every layer which was in there previously. So if you save the file twice, you'll end up with multiple versions of the same layers. It's, it's easy enough to fix, I mean all you need to do is go through and delete them. To be honest, the M4A4 layer is not doing anything anyway. If I turn it on and off, it literally does nothing. So I can delete both those layers. Then you've got the yellow layer, which is the yellow, which is good. You've got the blue layer, which is the blue, and you've got the base, which is the grey base. Then you've got the group layers, which again don't do anything. As I turn them off, you'll see they don't do anything, so I can bin both of those. Then you have the group, uh, then you have layer 2, which is the base of the background. Again, I don't need that, so I can delete both of those. Um, but what you've got now is you've got your object with it projected right through on both sides. You will notice that there are some errors which you'll need to tidy up once you're in the 3D program. Um, sometimes they're down to the UVs being shared with another part of the weapon, other times it can be a slight projection error, but really these are quite small and generally insignificant in comparison to the amount of time it would take in to texture this on a flat texture. So the last thing that I want to talk about within 3D Coat is how you export all your layers that you have here into a texture in, that you can use in Photoshop. That's quite simple. You go up to Textures, Export, and then All Layer Color. That's what you need to click. But once you've clicked All Layers, the uh, Save dialog should pop up. Um, obviously put in the name you want to save it and then just click save. And once the file is saved you can swap back to Photoshop. So I'll do that now. And you go file, open, and then you open the file you just saved. Now inside Photoshop you'll get the uh, texture. Uh, you'll notice that it has all the layers which were in 3D Coat, which is fantastic. Someone else might notice is obviously the different UV islands mean that the lines are kind of all over the place. Um, but this is expected as obviously it depends on the orientation of your UVs. One thing you might not have realised is that each UV island has the texture going right up to the edge of the corresponding UV island or the next UV island. And this is because inside 3D Coat there is an option uh, in under preferences called padding. Now what padding does is around the edges of each UV island it pads, in other words extends the edge outwards. Now this might not seem important but in video games it's really important that you have padding on. Um, generally, when you're looking at a gun from a distance, it won't actually be using this texture. It'll be using a much smaller texture called a mitmap. For the sake of time, I won't go into exactly what mitmaps are. If you want to find out more detail, then I'd recommend searching on the internet. But on a very basic level, 
as you move away from a weapon, so if it's on the ground and you walk away from it, the engine will reduce the texture size the further away you get away from it. Um, in order to do that, what it does is stores things called MIPS, which are basically smaller versions of the same texture. Now, if you don't have padding on your texture around the edges of your UV islands, then what you'll find as you move away from the object, you'll start to get little seams um, around your UV island, which will be visible on the, on the gun. So it's highly recommended to have uh, padding on your textures. Now that you've got this texture with the layers, you can edit it just like any other texture that you would have created um, in Photoshop or any other program. Um, for the purpose of this video, I'm not going to go into more detail. I will cover some of the design techniques and processes I use in a different video. But for now, what I'd like to talk about is how you can use the files that we've created today for any weapon or any design. So I'm going to close this now. And you'll see we still have our side view that we created earlier on. What I want to do is I need to save this file. Currently, it's been loaded in from uh, 3D Code. Um, into a special folder that it uses to talk to Photoshop. But what we want to do is save a version for ourselves. So I'm just going to go to File and Save As, and I'm going to navigate to where I want to save it. And then I'm just going to call it Mark 2 because I've saved it already. Okay, so now I've saved this, um, I can close that. And then I'll go back to 3D Coat. Now, obviously, we've done all this work to it, but obviously, I don't want to keep this design, it was purely as a demonstration. But if you remember earlier on, um, when we were storing our camera position, we saved a version of this file. So I'm going to load that up now. Uh, so it's this file here. Now what you'll see is that is um, a blank gun, um, which has our stored camera position that we talked about before. Now the key with this is, is because we've stored this camera position, I know that this position matches the Photoshop file. So if I was going to start a new gun design, all I would do is go File, New. I would load up my template. This is what I'm going to call my template. Obviously, my template wouldn't have these designs in it, so this would be my template. I could load this up without opening 3D Coat, without opening any other program. I could do a design, you know, uh, work. so I could work away on my new design, you know, whatever it may be. And then what I can do is load up 3D Coat. I can close that. File open the demo file, put the camera in the right place, export the projection, which gives me this. I move this out of the way, and then I can drag that on top and close this file. Now I've got a new file with all saved. I can get rid of the files, the layers I don't need, like these, and then I can save that, and then I can go back to 3D Coat and that loads it onto the, to the model. And there you have it. A design that's not very nice, but um, it's a very quick way to work. Um, if you did this for all the weapons in the workshop, then you'd have a starting point that is effectively in Photoshop for all the weapons in the game. Okay, so I think that's about it for showing you how I create a template in 3D Coat. I'm going to switch over to ZBrush now and show you the same process. Uh, it will be a lot shorter because I've already covered a lot of the points inside 3D Coat, um, but you'll get to see how the programs differ slightly. So as I said at the end of the last uh, section, I'm going to run through the same process of creating a template, but this time using ZBrush. So obviously, first things first, let's open ZBrush. Once ZBrush is open, it will generally open with the light box enabled. Uh, also, it never quite maximizes properly, so I'll always minimize and then maximize again. Now it's in the screen. Uh, so then, yeah, you want to turn off light box. The other thing you want to do is set your resolution to a um, format that you like working in. For me, I like generally working in HD sizes. So I'll click resize and I'll turn on um, constraint proportions. Uh, the other thing I like to do is turn off the range. I prefer it to be a flat background. Um, so once we've done that, then what we want to do is import our OBJ. So again, we're going to use the M4A4. So I'll load that. Uh, if you click with the left mouse button and drag out, that will create your uh, gun inside ZBrush. 
If you then turn on Edit, you can rotate the ZBrush just like 3D Coat. If you hold Shift, it snaps it to side, to side and front and back views. And once you obviously have the gun in the right orientation, you need to make sure, like 3D Coat, the perspective is off. So it's off currently. Then you want to frame that. And the other thing that we'll do is we'll zoom out slightly. ZBrush is massively different in the way it works to 3D Coat um, when it comes to viewports and all the other features that are in ZBrush. I'm not going to touch any of that. There is a lot of videos online already about how to use ZBrush. Um, but if you're just trying to basically align the gun to the edges of the, um, of the document, then what you need to do is you need to zoom out slightly so you can see the edges of the document. Then you need to scale your weapon so that it, like in 3D Coat, leaves a slight boundary but is filling as much of the page or as much of the document as possible. So now that I'm reasonably happy with the position, the next thing I need to do is change the type of material. Now just like 3D Coat, when you export this to Photoshop, it will create a lighting layer. Unlike 3D Coat, ZBrush, you can choose what you want the lighting to look like uh, inside Photoshop. So for me, generally the one that I think works reasonably well is the Skin Shade 04. That gives you this kind of uh, shading model, which is not too dark so you can still see your design, but also uh, allows you to see all the different shapes that you need. The next thing, once you've got the document to the right size, is just like in 3D Coat, you need to store a camera position. Now, unlike 3D Coat, it's a little bit more difficult to save a camera position in ZBrush. Um, I'm sure there's other ways, but the way I normally do it is I go to document, then there's a thing called Z app link, which is basically what connects to Photoshop and other programs. Um, now what you can do with that app link is store a custom view. So if you click custom view one, then you do like we did in 3D Coat and move the model. Then when you go to custom view one, it snaps you back to that same position. So this works just like 3D Coat did. The only difference is you actually have to specifically save these views. So what I do is go save. So that's saved. Um, now what we need to do is get this into Photoshop. Now, like in 3D Coat, where you want to have the resolution bigger um, than this so that when you're working on your design, uh, you are getting enough resolution to uh, match the texture size. So what we will do is we'll double the, the dimensions. So you click double here and it will go, do you want to resize this document? You click yes. Now when you've done that, you'll notice that you can't rotate the model anymore. This is because it flattened the canvas. So what you need to do now is you need to go to uh, layer and click clear. Then you need to re-drag out your model. Click edit. Now we've already stored the camera position. So we don't need to, to rotate the model or anything, we just need to click custom view. Um, obviously the document is very big, so in order to be able to get a, a better size, we need to zoom out. So now that we're happy with the position, we can go to our Z-Link app. This is the same as the, uh, the button that we connect to Photoshop in 3D Coat. So you can click the Z-Link app. You do not want to enable pr perspective, so you just click OK. Uh, you do want to enable colorize. And what that does is, just like in 3D Coat, it exports a document that allows you to, to paint your own design. Uh, unlike 3D Coat, it only gives you two layers. Um, so the first layer is your lighting, and the second layer is your editable layer. So what we can do is add a new layer and create a background. So just like in 3D Coat, it gives you a, a nice clear edge to your model. In the same way we did before, we can create a group and add our lighting and uh, editable layer into the group. Then we control click on the icon, which gives us a mask. We can assign that to our group. And now we're in the same position as we were uh, with 3D Coat. We can paint our design and it stays only on the weapon and doesn't go out the boundaries. Now, obviously, there are differences between ZBrush and 3D Coat. 
one of the main differences with ZBrush is that you can't really have multiple layers. Um, it is possible, but it's not really recommended. So what you need to do is you need to collapse this layer into this layer. So the easiest way to do that, or if you have multiple layers, uh, let's say we did that, you would need to collapse that one, uh, merge that one down to this layer, which means that now you've got them on one layer, and then you need to merge that down again. So now you've got your custom layer, which has got your design on it. Once you're happy with that, you can save it just like you did in 3D Coat, so you can see it's not saved at the moment, and again, it's given its own unique name. So you click Save, and you can go back to ZBrush, and it will say it's found new layers, do you want to return to merge? So the issue with this is it really needs to be the same amount of layers that came out of ZBrush. I just wanted to show you the issue you can run into. So we'll go back to Photoshop. Now we kind of need to take them out of this. There's a few extra stages uh, when you're working with ZBrush. So now we've got what we need. We can save that. Go back to Photoshop. Uh, go back to ZBrush, excuse me. And then all you need to do is click this button, re-enter ZBrush. So you click that and it projects it onto the model as you can see. Now you want to turn on double sided and you want to turn fade off. Now fade means that as it goes around um, the object towards faces that are perpendicular to the view, it will fade it off. Now obviously we want to project this right through the object. So we want that off and we want double sided on which means that it's going to project onto both sides. So we accept that. Now this highlights another issue that you're going to run into. Obviously with ZBrush, um, one of the there's various ways you can texture a model. Um, this way is not useful for what we need. Um, this is using the polygons, which if I zoom in, you'll see. See where each of the, excuse me, it's using the vertices. Each of these vertices can be coloured, so it's not high enough uh, resolution mesh to be able to use um, this method. So what we will do is we'll move back to our position and what we need to do is create a texture which will mean that when we project on instead of trying to instead of ZBrush applying it to the vertices it will apply it to the texture. So the first thing that you need to do when you're creating a texture is tell it what size you want the texture to be. So in order to choose your texture size you pick one of these boxes or change this value here. 204 is fine for what we're about to do. So I will then create a new texture, and there you go, it's a nice white texture. If you find that you've done a design where, uh, you know, obviously this isn't a very good design, but if you find you've done a design that you're happy with, but you forgot to do the step of creating a the texture, there's quite an easy way to get this onto your uh, exportable uh, document. Obviously, if I save this now, so if I make a change and then click Save, and go back to ZBrush, it's not going to pick it up because we've already applied that uh, document to the mesh. And unlike 3D Coat, it's not constantly looking for it. It only looks for it once you've exported it. Once you've re-imported it, it stops looking for it anymore. So what you need to do is, if you go to your history, there's a button down here which basically makes a clone of this. So we click Clone, and that creates a duplicate uh, version of this of the file and the reason why we need to do that is you'll see in two seconds so when I go back to here and go to click the Z-Link app which will take this and put it into Photoshop click OK it will ask me if I want to update this obviously that's because it's the same file name so it's going to try and replace this file with the blank gun from ZBrush so yes we want to update that now what we need to do is get our design onto this model. So we literally hold shift, you select the one that you want to put the design from into, hold shift and drag it onto the document. Because the document is exactly the same size and, and is all aligned, it works perfectly. So we can close those. Then we want to collapse these down, so merge layers, which means now we have our two layers again. I go in here and save this. So it's all saved. Go back to ZBrush. It will say it will detect that the file in Photoshop's changed and ask me if I want to import that. So I'll click re-enter ZBrush. Now again, I need to make sure that these are correct. So that is how I want it. You want fade it off and double sided on. So then I accept that. Now this time, it's very much more accurate, like the um, 
like the design was in Photoshop. The reason for this is because obviously it's applying it to the texture now, as you can see here. Um, it's quite nice because you get a preview. Uh, so hopefully you can see it's a very similar process between ZBrush and 3D Coat. If you would like to create a template, that then you can, uh, the same process I showed you at the end of the last section, where you're able to just open the Photoshop file, work on that, uh, do your design, then open the ZBrush and project it on. Uh, I'll quickly show how to do that. First things first, obviously, if you're creating a template, you want to get rid of any design that you currently have. So all we need to do is go New Texture. That creates a white texture for us. Then we need to go up to File, Save As, and then we choose our file name for this. I'm just going to use Temp. So, yes. So that's it saved. Um, now we want to create our template file. So we go to our Z-Line app. We want to turn fade off and double-sided on and click drop now. Now that loads our template into Photoshop. We've got our three layers. We have our lighting layer, our um, editable uh, layer, and then our background. So this is a, a reasonably good um, setup. Um, obviously, you can add a group if you wish, um, similar to what we did before, where we take these two files and drag them into a group. Uh, control click the icon and create a mask. Now that's pretty much our design. Uh, obviously then I can add a layer and do any design that I want. So now that I'm happy with the template that I have, I can file save this. Saved one which I'm going to call temp ps for Photoshop and then click save. So now uh, I have obviously my uh, template file. So now that I've got all my files saved, I can show you the process of creating a new weapon. So first things first is you'd obviously load up your template file, which is what we have here. Um, select the editable layer that we want. Do our design. So once that brush is loaded, uh, we want to file, open, find our uh, template file for the M4A4, which loads this, which is nice. Um, the only thing we don't have now is our view, so we need to go to our Z-Link app properties and go load views. Select the view that we saved earlier on. So that's done that now, and then all we need to do is check that that works, which it does. We'll zoom out so we can see the whole design. Then all we need to do is click the Z-Link app. We don't want to enable project uh, perspective, so we keep that off. Click OK. That loads this file in, which is great. We can then, if we hold Shift, we can take our design layer and drag that into our new ZBrush file. You can save this or you can close it. Once you've uh, got your design, you can obviously collapse that down. So we merge down. That gives us our two layers that we need for ZBrush. Obviously, it's in the correct location using the correct file name. So we just click, uh, we just click Save or Control S. We can then go back to ZBrush and it will realize that the file has changed. So we can re-enter ZBrush. Obviously, we need to change these settings because they default back to the default settings. So you need to turn fade off and you want double-sided on. So let me accept that. And then you can see that it's basically projected the texture all the way through the model for us. And that's the way you can use a template. Um, inside ZBrush, it's a very similar process to 3D Coat, but obviously there is differences. Um, one thing to mention just before we finish this tutorial, um, there's one big, big difference between uh, ZBrush and 3D Coat. Now, in 3D Coat, we were able to export individual layers out of 3D Coat, whereas in ZBrush, you can only really export the texture. So the way to do that is you go clone texture, which basically creates a copy of the texture in the texture palette. Then you need to select that if it's not already selected for you and then click export. And then we can give it whatever name we want. So we'll call it temp texture. Now, if we go back to Photoshop, we can load in that temp texture, which is here. Now, you'll see it's only brought in one layer. ZBrush can uh, do multiple layers, but it's not really supported. 
So if you're trying to do multiple layers of ZBrush, it is a workaround and it can take a long, a lot of effort to be able to get a good layer system. Um, obviously you can do simple things like doing color selects and separating layers that way, but there's no good or easy way, should I say, there's no easy way of being able to export layers from ZBrush into a PSD. So that's one of the major drawbacks with ZBrush. Obviously ZBrush has a host of other features, you know, amazing features for sculpting 3D meshes. Um, but in texturing terms, I think 3D Coat is probably more flexible than ZBrush is. So it's just something to bear in mind if you're trying to decide which package to use for creating CS gun. If you'd like to see more videos from me and be kept up to date on the latest tutorials, there's a clickable link on screen to join my YouTube channel and links in the description to my screen group and workshop. I really hope you've enjoyed what you've seen today. Thanks very much for watching and I look forward to seeing your designs in the future.